If you're not sure if they're being mean or if it's just normal behavior you misunderstood, listen to my other podcast, Love and Abuse, over at loveandabuse.com. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello, welcome to the show. My name is Paul Coliani, and I am here to help you increase your emotional intelligence so that you can avoid dysfunction handle toxic situations with grace and ease, and show up as your authentic self. Everything I talk about in this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that can affect your physical or mental health. All right, let's handle a tough one today. This first segment has to do with um, what this person considers perhaps an irrational person in her family. In fact, um, she read my article, How to Deal with Irrational People, over at theoverwhelmedbrain.com if you're interested, and uh, she said she got a lot from it. She said that she uh, even liked how I handled some of the comments from people that might have needed a little bit of um, tact (laughs) in my replies. She said some of them were a bit spicy, so if you're interested in those comments, head over there and check that article out. Uh, she says, I have an issue I'm dealing with, and I'm hoping you hoping you can share your opinion or suggestion on what to do. I'm sure you get a ton of emails daily, so I won't be offended if you don't have time for mine. I'm a mom of two daughters. Uh, when my oldest was a child, I immediately noticed she behaved differently than the other children her age. She was very quiet, shy, and introverted. She had a vocabulary about half the size of the other kids, and she rarely spoke. She would answer questions, but rarely initiated conversation with anyone. She was also very obedient, never threw a tantrum in her life. She received a full psychological workup at age 8. She was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. This anxiety only grew as she did and led to self-harming behaviors and suicidal ideation. She spent several months at an RTC, I think she means uh, treatment center, when she was a young teenager and has been doing very well since. However, she is still very anxious and has a very, very low self-esteem. She overreacts to everything and gets offended easily. Being around her is like walking on eggshells constantly. She's very sensitive and overreacts to pretty much every comment I make to her. Even if it's something as innocuous as... Please remember to pick up your clothes off the floor. She sees a therapist and is on medication. Dealing with her on a daily basis is mentally exhausting. I'm ashamed to admit it, but this is the point I don't want to be around her. Dealing with someone this emotionally needy on a daily basis has really made me miserable. I cry myself to sleep almost every night about how guilty I feel that I have any resentment. To make matters worse, my other child is a very well-adjusted, emotionally stable kid. And so I'm constantly thinking, what is wrong with this one? What happened to make her like this? I try to be as loving and caring as I can when dealing with her, but honestly, sometimes my patient runs out and I have no reserves of empathy left to give. I often leave the room because I no longer know what to do or say, and I hide in another room until she calms down. I have no idea if you've ever heard of a person with this type of deeply anxious personality, but I would love advice. All right, thanks for sharing that. That is a very difficult situation. You did mention her age. I didn't want to say her age or mention any names that you put in the email because I wanted to make sure I kept your privacy and confidentiality. And it's quite possible that um, the people you're talking about could tune into this show too. There's a chance they could tune in because they're experiencing what they're experiencing and maybe a show like this could help. So it would be great if they could tune into something like this or this show and they find a solution, but um, you're reaching out to ask me directly if I have any advice. And let me preface my reply with this disclaimer. I do not have children, 
and I can only tell you my observations about behavior and emotions. So that's good in one respect because I'm an outside observer and uh, I can probably give you some more practical thoughts without getting involved in the emotional aspect of what it takes uh, and all the difficulties you run into while raising children. So there's one caveat. The second caveat is I've never really worked with somebody that young or studied childhood disorders like that. However, I do have an opinion on it and I could be wrong. So I preface my reply with telling you I could be wrong. And in fact, because I am not a professional in that area, I highly recommend you shut me off right now. (laughs) So I don't give you the wrong advice. I don't point you in the wrong direction. I'm only going to tell you what I know about behavior and personalities and responses and reactions and, of course, emotions and all that stuff associated with um, living your life every day and dealing with people every day and I'm assuming since you read the article how to deal with irrational people that you believe your daughter is irrational or you can't figure out how to work with her how to deal with her how to communicate with her so you are looking for answers in that respect the first question that comes to mind again shut me off before I talk uh, (laughs) the first question that comes to my mind is Who did she model? When I think about kids and myself growing up and my siblings and other parents that I've worked with, I like to ask the question, or at least in my own mind, who did she model? Who was her primary role model or secondary role model where she learned this behavior? She may or may not have one. I'm just asking if you know. Because if you know, it's helpful to know who she modeled, because it might give you a clue to behaviors. And there might be some healing that needs to be done because of that modeling. And uh, modeling when you're a child is you act like the adults around you in the situations they're in. So if you or her dad handled situations poorly, or at least in a, in a way that wasn't helpful, then you might find her handling situations in a way that's not helpful as well. You may or may not notice that if you are the person she models, but an outside observer such as myself might notice that, or any professional would notice that, and it would give them a clue as to where this behavior developed. Because you're telling me that this behavior developed a long time ago when she was very young. And so unless she received it genetically, from you or a grandparent, unless there's something like that going on. I like to look at any behaviors in the family where she may have gotten that, may have learned it. Because when we're children, we learn how to respond to things by the way other people respond to things. I mean, that's one of the ways. So that's my question is, who did she model? Now, maybe she didn't model anyone. Maybe she rebelled. This is what happens too. This is what I see and this is what professionals do. They study this kind of stuff and they say some children will rebel. Some children will see what a parent or guardian or sibling does and not like it at all. In fact, not like it so much that they'll do the exact opposite. Good example is me. My stepfather drank alcohol and passed out drunk almost every day of my existence since I was one. So I saw this behavior from a very early age and I could have gone one of two directions. I could have gone the modeling route and did what he did, became an alcoholic and became an addict and did those types of behaviors, or I could have rebelled and wanted nothing to do with alcohol and all the drugs I've seen growing up from other people doing them around me. And that's exactly what I did. I rebelled. It was healthy to rebel because it protected my body, it protected my sanity, but at the same time, uh, it brought along with it uh, toxic behaviors. Because even though I was against drugs and alcohol most of my life, I became highly judgmental of those who did things like that. I became highly judgmental of a lot of things, not just drugs and alcohol. So that gave me some toxic behaviors uh, that turned into emotionally abusive behaviors that I brought into my relationships. 
So rebelling, even though there's some benefit to what I was rebelling against, there was also a huge detriment, and that caused a lot of problems in my relationship. And of course, if you're interested, I slowly healed from all this stuff, and I'm not judgmental about that stuff anymore, and the people in my life, yes, they can drink around me. I'm not a big proponent of drugs, but if they want to do that, they can go do it on their own. But I am definitely uh, okay with a lot of stuff now because I had to heal. And I'm hoping that the person you're talking about, your daughter, is able to heal from whatever is going on. And I don't know if I thanked you for writing this, but thank you for writing all this and sharing this because I know it's difficult. I know what you're dealing with is very difficult. So my first question was who did she model or who did she rebel against if you have someone in mind that's good it's just a piece of information is it dad is it you is it someone else I don't know but it's important to understand how you respond to the events in life passes on to how they respond to the events in life and whether that's the opposite response or the same response it's often the same response. This is how we end up marrying our dad or our mom. You know, you heard that saying, you married your dad because your dad is a controlling narcissist and you married a controlling narcissist. So this is how children grow up and develop these dysfunctions and they develop these unhealthy attractions to people that will not make them happy, but it's familiar enough that they think it's part of happiness and they think that's what makes up a family. But it doesn't. It just makes up a dysfunctional family. Uh, I'm not saying it can't work, but it often doesn't work. That's a good piece of information to know if she modeled someone or rebelled against someone. Regardless if those apply or not, one of the primary things in your message that really rings true for me that might be happening is the way you show up for her. Because what you told me is that you give all the love and compassion and empathy and attention that you can to her. And I imagine you're probably the type of person that really feels for her and is there for her and shows up in all the ways you can for her. And like you said, with empathy, and you probably just want her to be healthy and want her to be better. And you've heard me say this before, if not replay every episode until you hear me say it. (laughs) What I say is that when you respond to someone the same way every time and the response doesn't get you the results that you want, you need to change the way you show up. I say it a little differently every time, but I said something like that. The way you respond to someone, if it's the same way every time, for example, if you cry every time somebody says something to you or yells at you or something like that, and they don't stop the behavior, then crying isn't working. I know that sounds strange because you're hurt and you want to cry, but if it's an effort to show them that you're hurt, then crying doesn't show them that you're hurt, so it doesn't work. Again, you might be crying because it really does hurt and you don't know what else to do. But this is the part that I want to share with you, you the person who wrote this letter, that since you've been probably showing up the same way over and over again, highly compassionate, highly empathetic, trying to be there for her, telling her that you're there for her, being loving and caring, and you said you get to the point where you you no longer know what to do or say, and then you hide in another room. Let me throw something at you. I don't know if it's going to be pleasant for you to hear, and maybe you've already tried this. I don't know, but If you've been responding to her this way most of the time, I think it's time to change it up. And I think it's time to, uh, how can I say this? Be more disciplined in yourself. And the discipline comes in the form of, how can I say this? (laughs) Be less empathetic and be more of a rock solid support system of love. I'm going to explain that, but I want you to get that in your head. There's a difference between being the empathetic person that gets in the passenger seat and has the experience with them, as opposed to being sympathetic, which is watching what happens, caring about what happens, and letting them talk about what happens without your judgment 
or getting into your own stuff or getting into their stuff, but mostly getting into your own stuff because when you turn on the empathy, you tend to get into your own stuff. It's sort of what it's all about. Hey, you know, somebody's dog died, you feel bad for them and you can get right into that space because you've lost an animal too. So now you're feeling what they're likely feeling, except maybe they're feeling at the worst level because it's happening now. But you can certainly empathize with that person because they're experiencing a pain that you know. She's experiencing something and the way you're showing up for her doesn't seem helpful. It may be just enough to keep the relationship hanging by a string, but it doesn't seem to help the situation because it seems that neither of you get into a better space. It seems that you're going downhill and she just barely stays on the verge of whatever she's staying on the verge of, wherever she is. And so I congratulate you for being there for her. That's certainly not the problem. You are certainly there for her, but are you there in a way that she will benefit most and will not drain your energy down to nothing because that's the difference between being there for somebody sympathetically and being there for somebody empathetically and um, again I'm going to expand on this about being rock solid in your love and support when I was doing one-on-one coaching there's a difference between the way I would show up for a client and the way I would show up for my girlfriend my girlfriend, I would feel empathetic. I would get into that space with her. I'm part of her life. It certainly is harder not to be that way with family that you care about. But I can still jump out of empathy, feel the sympathy, and be a rock-solid wall of support and love for her without getting into my stuff or her stuff. I mean, she can talk about her stuff, but I don't go into immediate sadness zone. I go into a state of curiosity and listening and being there, being very present, not starting to lose it myself. I am just there. I am just listening. I am just allowing to be who she is. I can be that way with my girlfriend, but I'm almost always that way with clients because when I've had clients in front of me, I'm always sympathetic. I'm always there for them. I'm the rock solid person they need to know that if they start crying, I'm not going to start crying too, but I'm going to be there creating a safe space for them to be whoever they are. And I think they feel that. Somebody will start crying. Somebody might start yelling that they hate their life or hate their wife or hate their husband, whatever space they're in. They are sharing something that is deep, that is maybe painful. They're in a very vulnerable space. It's a very vulnerable space for many people, most people, to either start crying or sharing something that's hard to share, something embarrassing, something that makes them feel guilty, something that they just don't want anybody else to know. That is a very vulnerable space. So... When somebody is in the space that you are talking about with your daughter, can you show up more like a coach, more like a therapist, more like somebody who can dissociate from what they're talking about and what they're saying, even if it's about you? Can you dissociate, meaning you disconnect from yourself and you just show up as the Dalai Lama, you just show up as somebody is with, uh, you know, Mother Teresa, somebody with unconditional love for another human being and not so much as, oh my God, this is my daughter. Uh, I feel so bad. I'm going to start crying because I don't know what to do. I think you need to get out of that space. I think the place you've been with all the compassion and the love and empathy, which is wonderful and commendable, I think you need to jump out of that space. I think you need to be more of the leader, the authority, someone that she can look to and say, wow, you're not losing it after I just told you that sad story. And you say, I'm not here to lose it. I'm here for you. I can totally sympathize with where you are, but I just want to be here for you, whatever you need. 
being in that type of space is like personal leadership. And people that are in an anxious space or a fearful place, they look for strong leadership most of the time. I mean, I don't know if you remember the story I told. If you've been listening a while or if you haven't, a long time ago, in fact, I told this story. This is funny. I told this story in How to Deal with Irrational People. There was a woman I was flying next to. We were flying to some city somewhere, and she started talking to me right away. She was across the aisle, and um, I think it was when we were starting to fly or when we were in the air, she started getting a little nervous. She started saying things like, oh, you know, I don't like what's going on. I don't like this. And I was asking her questions, and at the time I was a coach, and I was fully trained. I was fully studied, and I kind of knew how to talk to people, and she started sort of freaking out <laughs> because she felt claustrophobic and all these people were in the, the plane and she's right next to me and she starts just feeling this claustrophobia so I talked to her and I talked calmly to her and I showed up for her as someone who was absolutely secure in himself and had no fear about what was going on and talked to her as if I knew everything was going to be all right. Now, I didn't even have to say that. Hey, everything's going to be all right. Don't worry about it. I didn't even have to say that. What I did say is, you know, tell me what's going on. What What's happening? And she said, you know, I'm just having this fear and I got to get out of here. And so I wanted to make sure that she was calm and she didn't start making a scene. I just wanted to keep everything very cool. And so um, throughout the flight, I think she was okay most of the time, but it actually got worse after we landed and we were taxiing to the terminal and she started saying I gotta get out of here this this is freaking me out I gotta go and she started breathing fast and she didn't know what to do and we were still moving and there was no way that they were gonna let her off while we're still moving and so I had to think fast I had to do something really fast and so the whole time she'd been good and everything been fine and I just reminded her hey we're on the ground we're gonna be off very soon but it didn't matter she started becoming what I considered irrational because it didn't make sense to me that she was having this sort of panic attack but I knew why she was it wasn't like I was thinking oh she's a problem no I knew why she was having it she was claustrophobic and she was in this tight space she was definitely having some sort of nervous thing going on so what has happened is that no matter what I said she wasn't having it she was still freaking out and she wasn't gonna stop so I decided to be a rock-solid wall of love and support, and that meant being the leader she needed. And what I did was I stood up, and I stood right in front of her. This was like right after we stopped, and people were just starting to get up. I stood right in front of her, and I said, now I want you to pay attention to me really close, and I made her focus her attention on me. If she started to veer off, I said, no, pay attention to me. I want you to look at me and listen to me closely. Right now, Everyone is getting off the plane, and you are going to get off too. And I want you to know that you're absolutely fine. We made it. We're on the ground. Everyone's going to leave here shortly, and you're going to go with them. And I want you to know that you're going to be fine. And, uh, you know, you'd think that my story would say, oh, she took that and she felt better. No, she didn't. (laughs) What happened was I had to give her a mission because she was so focused on the fear and and getting out of the situation that I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. And as soon as I said that, I really got her attention because now I'm steering her in a direction that might be a solution for her. I said, here's what I want you to do. And she looked at me and she said, yeah. I said, I want you to tap people on the shoulder calmly and say, could you please let me through? I have an emergency. And Then you tap on the next shoulder and you say, could you please let me through? I have an emergency. But I said, you have to do this calmly. Keep your cool because if you don't, it's not going to go smoothly. When you do this, you need to be patient and very cool. So that's what she did. She tapped on the first shoulder and she said, excuse me, I have an emergency. Can I get through? And of course, people are going to move aside and they did. And so I watched her tap on everyone's shoulder as she reached the front of the plane so she would be the first one off. So she got off the plane. She was one of the first ones, if not the first one off. And I eventually got through with everybody else off the plane 
and I saw her standing there and she just had a big smile and she was so grateful and she hugged me and she was just happy to be there and through the danger that she perceived and she was just grateful. There is a lesson here. There's a reason I told you this story because when you are a leader in someone's life, they have to trust you. They have to trust what you're telling them is 100% true. And sometimes the way to get through to someone is to be absolutely sure in yourself. Absolutely confident in yourself. They need to smell it. They need to see it. They need to feel your confidence, your surety. They need to experience you as someone that no matter what happens in their life, what you're saying is absolutely true because you're so darn confident in yourself. So there's one part of this. There's one lesson is that when you show up for somebody as confident in yourself and you know what you're saying is right, they're going to draw from that and soak it in. They're going to make it part of their reality because they're looking for some semblance of organization and linearity and just uh, direction. They're looking for something. And when you show up with organized thoughts and linear thinking and direction, you give them what they need through osmosis, through your behaviors, the way you talk. This is one part of this. The person who wrote to me is the person in your life that is feeling anxious, that has maybe some confusion, that is in fear or is you know, experiencing what they're experiencing. Do they have a solid, confident leader in their life that they can look to that no matter what happens, they know that leader is going to be there and not leave the room, not start crying, not hide? Can she count on you through the worst of it? I'm asking a lot. I know I am. But the way you've been responding hasn't been working. And when you are dealing with somebody that really doesn't have any healthy coping skills, they need someone around them that not only has healthy coping skills, but is a leader in their own life. I can't think of a better word than leader. Somebody who is confident in the way they're leading their own life. That is someone that you can look to. This is why some people vote for certain people in politics. They see the leadership that they want in their life and that that person is going to represent them. I'm not going to get into politics, but I want to tell you why this happens. Some people see certain people as leaders. And when we have those leaders in our family, we can sometimes minimize the drama and the trauma and the toxicity and everything that happens because you show up as somebody that people can rely on. So that's one lesson from that story. The second lesson is giving somebody purpose or a mission. If your daughter's life is just out of control or she doesn't know what to do or she's not sure how to think, whatever she's going through, once you've shown up as this confident person in yourself and she knows that you'll be there no matter what, then when you say, okay, this is what I need you to do, she's going to trust you and she's going to feel like she now has a mission or a purpose and it's going to lead her in a direction that is better for her. I'm not saying this is going to work 100% because there are certain steps to get there and I'm going to share one of them, but what you need to do is when you have embodied the leader or the, the person that she can look up to no matter what, someone that is a solid rock of love and support that doesn't buckle under pressure, that doesn't fall apart because they're not showing up as the daughter that you want or if she needs something strong in her life and she's not getting that strength, that mental strength, that emotional strength, then it might be very difficult for her to get into a space that feels like any type of normalcy. And this may be hard for you. It may be hard to be mentally strong for her. But if you want to improve the relationship, I do believe this is a good step to take to be that mentally strong person. So let me give you at least one step toward being mentally strong. And again, this is something called dissociation, where you step out of your stuff and you become a person of strength and 
absolute love for the person's well-being, absolute support for wherever they are, even if you disagree with it, and non-judgmental, because anything they say you may have judgments about, but you need to step out of those judgments and just be there to listen, no matter how bad it gets. Because sometimes people are going through their stuff, through their trauma, through their anxiety, and when they start sharing it, someone might say, oh, it's going to be all right. Don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Which can immediately invalidate what they're expressing. And if they feel invalidated, they're less likely to get to the deeper stuff. They'll stay at the surface level. So if you've done any invalidating, um, not intentionally, I, I do think you had the right intentions, but if you did any invalidating in the form of, don't worry, everything's going to be all right, what you're doing is you are invalidating her reality. Because in her reality, nothing may be all right. Everything may be going crazy. And she just probably wants someone to agree. I'll never forget when I started agreeing with people that life sucks. <laughs> Some people would come up to me and say, you know what, life sucks. And I go, you know what, I agree. And they look at me and they say, what? You're supposed to be the coach. You're supposed to be the person that brightens my day. I was like, are you kidding me? Life is hard as hell. I get it. I know exactly what you mean. For once, they can breathe. They, for once, they don't have to defend their position. For once, they have somebody that understands that doesn't try to talk them out of it. I don't try to talk people out of their reality. If that's their reality, that's their reality. I'm not going to change it. Let's just work with it. Let's go with it. Let's dive into it. Let's explore it together. And let's walk through the difficulties together and let's walk out of it together. That's what I like to do. So there's a lot of lessons in what I just spoke of here in this first segment. And thank you so much for sharing what you're going through. I'm not a child expert. <laughs> I'm not a professional in this area. I think there are more people more qualified that can probably help you with this. Uh, certainly, I didn't talk about any um, other diagnoses that you might have to get checked out. I've heard uh, parents with children that found out their child had Asperger's or autism and other things like that, and that has caused emotional or mental challenges that you may be experiencing, but I don't know. I definitely can't diagnose that. I am not qualified. And I'm sure you've talked to different psychologists and things like that, but I do know behavior and I do know relationships and I do know that when someone is in confusion, when they're afraid, when life is falling apart around them, it's sure as hell nice to have somebody that's stable, that's supportive, that doesn't fall apart with them, that doesn't fall apart on their own, at least from what they can tell, and shows up for them as someone solid that's going to be right there, that no matter what emotional bullet comes flying out of them, that you're going to take the hit and you're going to take the next one, and it's not going to bother you. At least, you know, you've got to work on this. This is very difficult to step out of your own stuff, but you got to remember none of this is personal. None of this is about you. This is all about them and their experience and what they're going through. Even when they say this is all about you, you just have to be there. You have to step into a different role and embody the concept that you are this rock-solid wall of love and support. And no matter how many times they say, I hate you, it's your fault I'm like this, you're the worst parent or you're the worst person in the world, no matter how many times they say that to you, you still look at them with eyes filled with love, filled with support, knowing that deep down they really are in pain and that you want them to feel better. And you're going to stay in this place of near unconditional love as possible to show them that you will never, ever give up on them. And that's tough. That's tough for me to say because I know what you're dealing with. At least from what you're telling me, this is a daily struggle for you, this person who wrote. But I do believe if you're able to dissociate from the person that you've been and become this new person around her at least, I'm not saying you do this all the time. Sometimes you have to decompress after conversations. That's fine. But you do it on your own time. But you show up as someone who's solid, someone who's dependable, someone that they can share anything with. And you're not going to buckle. 
you're there because you love them. And if they need you, you're there for them. And the more you do this for them, the more they're going to soak that in, the the more confidence they'll absorb from you and the more personal leadership that they'll feel in themselves. That's the theory. (laughs) That's what I've done in my life. When people have shown up for me that way and it changes, it changes the direction of the relationship, it changes their trajectory. Um, You can't help everyone. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you try things like this and it still doesn't work. No matter what, there are some people that really gain from being this way. I mean, there's such thing as secondary gain. Sometimes people act a certain way because they, they're getting certain benefits from it. I'm not saying that this is happening. I mean, if she was diagnosed uh, with general anxiety disorder at such a young age, I'm sure there's something else going on there, which is why you probably need another expert to look at this. But I hate to put her under the microscope and put her through all that. I would rather just have you be the solid person in her life and you never mentioned her dad so I don't know if if he's around or what's going on there but certainly both of you as a unified front even if you're separated to be able to show up for her you know if he's still around if not then you do your best but I do know for sure that the way you're showing up now isn't working and probably isn't helpful because you keep getting the same results So if you listen to that segment, I told you to shut this off. (laughs) I told you not to listen. But if you did, I hope you got something from it. I hope it helps. And if it doesn't, the best thing I can say is I wish you much strength and resilience as you go through this. It sounds like she is now an adult and she'll probably be making adult decisions. And I I guess I could throw one last piece at you since, you know, this is all opinion-based. When you talk to her, I would start showing her that you trust her. In fact, I would even entrust her with things. And if she fails at something you entrust her with, tell her it's okay. You know what? I still trust you. I'm sure it was an accident. I'm sure it was unintentional. This starts to give her some sense of self-worth, some sense of self-esteem to show that somebody trusts her instead of thinking that, I don't know, maybe she's a basket case. That's what she might think you think of her. And maybe that's what she thinks of herself. So it can be very helpful to show somebody that you think highly of them and you trust them. And yes, you know they've gone through some issues, but that doesn't change who they are at the deepest level, at their core. And she's probably a wonderful person. And sometimes we need to help them bring it up and out of them. Thank you so much for sharing this. I hope this helped and I wish you the best. And that's it. That's the show today. I went on and on with that segment because it was an important topic. And I'm sure that some people can relate to what I talked about. When I come back, I'm going to say my thank yous and my goodbyes and my final words right after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I'm going to go right to our financial backers and thank them. These are the patrons of The Overwhelmed Brain, the financial supporters of the show. I'm going to start with Ward, who is a new monthly donator. Thank you, Ward. It was great connecting with you in email, and I appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Stephen and Deborah and Kim, Brian and Daisy, Julie, And Carol, you're new too. Very good to connect with you. I think there's an email sitting in my box right now. (laughs) If I haven't gotten to it, I will. Thank you, Carol, for your support. And Brad, it's always great to see your name too. All of you wonderful supporters, thank you so much for supporting the show. And for those who don't know, I'm talking about the patron program over at moretob.com. Those who find value in the show and want to give back and can give back, go to moretob.com and you can give a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter, uh, which makes you a patron, which gives you access to about 100 episodes that have never aired and some private workbooks and worksheets and a video archive, all kinds of things over there, over at moretob.com. Thank you, existing patrons, anyone that financially supports the show. I appreciate all of you. And I mentioned it at the very beginning of the show, loveandabuse.com. If you are in a difficult relationship and you want to know why, go to loveandabuse.com. This is my other podcast 
I talk about romantic, platonic, or family relationships and the fact that sometimes you leave conversations feeling bad. If that's the case, find out if you're being emotionally abused by listening to the podcast Love and Abuse over at loveandabuse.com. And finally, thanks to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. In closing, I'm going to mention one more thing about irrational people or disorganized, confused people, anxious people, whatever you see as someone that might be uh, challenging to deal with. And I don't mean to put anyone in a category here. Just because you're anxious doesn't mean you're broken. Just because you're disorganized doesn't mean you're dysfunctional. It has nothing to do with that. I'm talking about when you are around someone that you just can't relate to and you don't know how to help. I think, first of all, sometimes you can't help people. Sometimes you just have to drop the idea of trying to help and just be there to listen. Just create that safe, non-judgmental space that they can be themselves, even if they're suffering, even if they don't know what to do. Because if you don't know what to do, then the best you can do is just be there and listen. Does that mean you should be there every single day, all the time, 24-7? I'm not saying that you have to do that. I'm just saying that when there's opportunities, maybe you can do that. This is, of course, your choice, and depending on your circumstances, you may be able to choose that or not, or maybe you're in a situation where you have to deal with it and you have to face the person. And if that's the case, then it's important to work on your ability to be that rock-solid wall of love and support and not get sucked into any of the drama or any of the fear or trauma or worries or concerns or anything like that where you could easily be in the same space or worse because now your energy starts to drain because of where they are. So I talked about that personal leadership and how how to show up dissociated so you're not in your own stuff. And I didn't really get into how to do that. I mean, there's a way that I do it and I just use the words that I learned in NLP, which is uptime and downtime. When I'm in uptime, I'm not down in my stuff, connecting to myself, connecting to my stuff, thinking about my past or my future. I'm not down in that space inside of me. I'm up. I'm outside myself. I'm dissociated, meaning I'm not connecting with my own senses. It's like I'm in total observation and fascination mode, meaning someone's in front of me. I'm just observing. I'm being present for them. I'm watching their body language. I'm listening to their inflection. I'm learning about them. I'm wondering about them, but I'm not worrying about them, and I'm not getting to my own space where I think, oh, this person is suffering, so I feel bad about that. I don't get into that downtime space because when you're in downtime, again, just a term, but I'm not down in my stuff. I'm not connecting to my stuff. I'm not I'm not having all these thoughts about my own personal drama coming into my stuff or my emotions coming into my stuff. I can still feel that, but I remind myself that I am here for them. I am almost outside of my own body, looking at them, being there for them. And what helps me do that is observing their behavior, listening to their voice, watching their movements, watching their nonverbal cues, the way they move their hands, the way they move their eyes. I watch all this stuff and I listen to the way they talk. Not because I'm analyzing every single little thing. Sometimes I do that, but most of the time, it's so I stay out of my own stuff. Because when you can pay attention to what's outside of you, you stay up and out of your stuff. At least this is how I do it. But when you go inside and you start having thoughts and you let your thoughts go into that time that you lost your favorite pet or broke up with that person or... You know, all this sadness and all this worry and all this pain and all this fear, everything inside of you when you're down in that space and you're empathetic with somebody else, guess what? You're both going to be down in that space. And sometimes that's okay. I'm not saying that's wrong, but sometimes that's okay to practice. And I'll tell you why in a second. But the point of practicing uptime versus downtime is that when you're up 
you are outside of your own experiences in life and not letting those experiences and your emotions get in the way. You are that rock-solid wall of love and support for someone else. You are very present for them. It's almost as if you are an emotional guard that was hired by them to follow them around and be that solid wall that they need any time they need to lean on it. And again, I'm not saying that you show up for somebody like this all the time and just spend all your time and energy doing this. I'm saying sometimes they need it. Sometimes people need this. Some people in life need this because they're not in a space that they can show up for themselves this way. So they need to get it from somewhere. And sometimes it helps to have a role model to do this. So that's what I was telling the person who wrote the email earlier is to be that role model so that they can feel more comfortable in themselves knowing that if anything goes wrong or anything goes crazy, you're going to be right there to make sure that you set them back on course. They're going to feel more confident having somebody that they know will set them back on their course. And I said that you could also be in that space with them and experience empathy with them. And there is a time and a place to do this. And that's when you want to try to meet with them. And this can be helpful as well. When somebody is in a, let's just say a dark space, for example, the person who wrote, you know, her daughter is in this space and she doesn't know how to connect with her daughter. What you can do is enter their reality with them. You really have to be stable inside yourself to do this because it can take you into places that uh, can be a little scary, but this is something you can do is enter into their model of the world. And all that means is pretend you're having their experience. And ask yourself, what would that feel like? And then suddenly you're experiencing it with them. This is sometimes what I do. If I'm talking to somebody and they say, hey, life sucks, I hate it. I might say, yeah, life does suck. I hate it too. (laughs) I may not say those exact words. I might say, yeah, life does suck. And there are sometimes I hate it too. So, and they're going to be surprised and, you know, I'm not doing this disingenuously. I'm just getting into that space with them. There are times life sucks. <laughs> there really are. And if you can't experience that with somebody else, then you may never know what they're experiencing. So to get into that space with them, enter their reality, can help them relate to you and help develop more trust and Help them to see that you're not there to invalidate the reality they're having and you just want to show them that you completely understand and you're willing to talk about it if they're willing to talk about it, but you can develop a different relationship when you're there with them. So this might be helpful to the person who wrote as well, is that sometimes you jump into their reality and say, you know, I think I'd feel the exact same way you do if I went through what you went through. I think I understand now. And she may say, you don't understand. And you can say, you're probably right. I I probably don't understand. But what you went through, the way you just described it to me, would make me anxious too. It would make me ill. And really dive into that and really connect with them from their level, from where they are, so that they know that they're not alone and that somebody else understands And sometimes you have to do that too. Sometimes you have to go in the opposite direction of being that rock solid wall of support, even though you're still that, but get into that space with them. If they feel like they're in the corner of their bedroom as a small child and they're crying and they're scared, what would it feel like to be in the corner of your bedroom as a small child crying and scared? And then you're right there with them. And that is empathy. That is the full version of empathy. You're right there there and you're not discounting anything they're saying you're not invalidating anything they're saying because you believe them 100 percent because you are there and that can help you connect with them too and again you're in that space and it doesn't mean you have to stay in that space you just have to visit that space for a while with them so that they don't feel so alone and they feel like somebody finally understands And then eventually you can hold hands, walk out of the house, and you might experience something new, something different, something better. So again, thanks for joining me today. I hope you got something from today's subject. I appreciate you. And I just want to remind you to keep an open mind because we're going to talk about stuff like this sometimes. (laughs) We're going to talk about things that may require you to get a little uncomfortable sometimes. But that's how you step into your power and create the life you want. 
always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing.